Good evening. Oh. Good evening, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Nevin Gusak, your host of the Politically Homeless podcast. With me is my frequent, almost weekly guest, uh, geopolitical analyst and author, J.R. Nyquist. Hey, Jeff, how are you doing today? Okay. Um, I guess we're going to talk about philosophy today, and, and uh, it, it is a question because um, what I find is that people are not clear on their concepts. And so when we discuss uh, this, you know, uh, the Cold War history or strategy or any of these things, people don't seem to have the background and they fall back on, um, on the dogmas they've been taught or the, the disinformation they've swallowed from the Russians or the media or the press or, or conspiracy theory. And we need to be more sophisticated in our uh, ability to analyze. So philosophy gives us tools for this. And it's uh, it's obviously very difficult. So, so uh, I, I I wanted to talk a bit about Eric Verglin, and I've got I got an important his volume five of his collective works Modernity Without Restraint the Political Religions, and uh, he has a similar notion has similar notions to what um, you know Schumpeter and some others have said that Marxism is a religion. Um, you could I call it the uh, new religion, because it's not just Marxism, it's all the left and some of the right. It's the Nazi movement, it's the communist movement, it's um, psycho, you know, he points out it's a psychotherapy movement, which is not a political movement, but might have been. Um, you could even uh, throw uh, various other uh, political groups in with that. Um, uh, and and Ferglin calls them Gnostic mass movements, and I know some people into mysticism are going to be upset with me. Gnosticism was an ancient um, religious movement uh, that grew up about the same time of, as Christianity, and there are Jewish Gnostics, pagan Gnostics, and Christian Gnostics, but what they uh, all have in common is that in Gnosticism believes that the God of the Old Testament was a was not the real god he was a, a, a demiurge a demiurgos who created the world and so this is a bad place to be it's a it's a defective universe that we're into and we're imprisoned in these bodies you know so to speak uh the albigensian heresy shared a lot of these ideas and of course uh, the idea of course is to uh is a kind of rebellion against this reality, this creation that we're living in, and against, of course, the God that created it, which, of course, raises issues because it sounds very much like uh, Satan's revolt against God, right? Only Satan's the good guy. And that's kind of the structure of, of Gnostic thought. Um, and what Verglin says is he says that uh, Marxism and Nazism, for example, communism and Nazism are Gnostic mass movements. And how how could they be? Because they're kind of they're atheistic or secular. How can they be Gnostic? Uh, it, well, it's it's funny that uh, Stalin, in his uh, his introduction to Leninism, his uh, uh, basics of Leninism, basically starts talking about the demiurgos, which is very odd uh, for him to do. But um, the reason why is that the Marxists, for example, say that reality is bad because it's we've slipped into this haves versus have-nots, class warfare, and that we're going through this process of continuous conflict, class conflict and war, until we escape from this. And so what they've done is they've, they've made the world with property rights, and as it's ordered, as human society has been ordered for all of civilization, they've claimed that that's defective, and you have to revolt against it, right? And And of course, Nazism has the Jew, it's Jewish conspiracy, you know, the Jews, they, they've created this world and they've, they've made an, uh, the playing field not level, so we have to destroy the Jews to break free, right? That's sort of the Nazi idea. So they've got the same thing. The capitalists are holding us down, we have to revolt against them. The Jews are holding us down, we need to revolt against them. Communism and Nazism. So all is wrong with the world until you apply the violent solution, the revolution, and Hitler emphasized that National Socialism was revolutionary, just like the communists do, which meant violent. Um, and I, I think people don't understand why communism is 
is so destructive is that it basically essentially seeks the destruction of the existing order in a way that's pathologically focused on existence itself. But there's something about them that they want to destroy everything, whether they consciously realize it or not. It's something essential in their point of view. And this is what Verglund points out. Verglund says that Marx was a swindler. And he, he points out that essentially it's a, it's a philosophy of destruction, just like Nazism was. And therefore, it is, it is evil if you go to philosophy and say, well, what would be evil if the universe is made by a true divinity and the universe has this perfection and we're living in it? Um, somebody that wants to destroy it and revolt against the creator would be, well, that would be Satan, right? That would be satanic. So Virgilin is basically saying in a very sophisticated way that these modern mass movements are satanic. Well, and it, you know, my, you know, my reading too, to take, <clears throat> to pick up where you last left off, and he saw this up close and personally because he had, he was from Germany originally, fled Nazism. He saw that up close and personal. He was repulsed by amongst, well, many aspects of Nazi National Socialism, including uh, the Kristallnacht, if I remember correctly, correct me if I'm wrong, since you're more knowledgeable about Eric Berglin than well, I am. He was, he was in, uh, he went to university, he was born in Germany, but he moved to Austria and he went, uh, he taught at the University of Vienna. He was a political scientist there. Um, and uh, it was a very famous institution, but um, Austria was not brought into the Reich until 1938. Right when Kristall and Kristallnacht, uh, the was Austria, later that year. Was later that year. Austria was brought in in March, in and March. that was one of the things, if I recall correctly, that profoundly affected him. And well, he actually had to leave. He had to leave Austria immediately after the Anschluss, after the Nazi t t took over Austria. He didn't hang around for the Kristallnacht, which no, I think I, was in November, it, right? Yeah, it was in November, but from what I, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know he, but the violence of the Nazis, including Kristallnacht, obviously he was aware of what was going on, yeah. fled to Switzerland and then the United States. Yes. He was very aware of what was going on, so yes, he had did. And, experience. And I should point out, what he had done is he'd written a number of books that attacked, that basically philosophically attacked Nazism. And they were rather bold, and it was surprising he could find a publisher. But, of course, Austria wasn't part of the Reich when those books were published. But he, I think he managed to get some of them into Germany. It's in the German language. So he was in an arrest list. And one of the things that people marveled at is, well, why are you leaving Germany? You know, you're not a Jew or a communist, because they figured that the only people that would be leaving Germany would be Jews and communists, right? But he wasn't either. He wasn't Jewish and he wasn't a communist. So why was he leaving? Well, he said it just blew their mind that somebody would be against National Socialism who was a conservative who was not a Jew or a communist. Um, so he was a very principled person who obviously had to start all over again by going to the United States. Um, and philosophically, what, what he saw was that he made a number of points, what made Germany vulnerable to the takeover of the Nazis, which is the same thing that's making us vulnerable today, is he saw the disintegration of language and the corruption of intellectual thought, um, which paves the way for totalitarianism. And you'll see people, if you read Dostoevsky, you'll see that depicted in The Devils. You see that depicted in various of, of, of the intellectual parts of Dostoevsky's novels and the commentaries by Solzhenitsyn. Uh, the, 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 or, or Berdyaev, you would see that they would be talking about how Russian ideas, there was this negativity coming in in Russian cultural thought that was headed towards this socialist disaster, so much so that Dostoevsky wrote, I think it was in his diaries in the 1860s, he said socialism will kill 100 million people in Russia in the 20th century. This was Dostoevsky's fa famous prediction mm -hmm. about what socialism was going to do in Russia. And indeed, it came true. Be between National Socialism and Soviet Socialism, it easily killed 100 million people in Russia. And 60-something in, in, in million people the Soviets killed, and 30-something million people the National Socialist Nazis killed. Um, and, and so this becomes 
this question of mass Gnostic movements, communism, Nazism, all forms of totalitarianism, because now we see in, in the gender you know, uh, as change movement, we, 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 we see other movements, right? We see all kinds of things, ideas coming in. And what Virgilin pointed out is he said, there's this lack of clarity. There's this destruction of language. And, and first he said the German language, he said that the, the Kaiserreich uh, before World War I, the sort of uh, ideologies promoted by the Kaiser contributed to the disintegration of the German language, which is very interesting. And I would say that the sloganeering of both the Republicans and the Democrats in our country and this, the reduction of complex thoughts into slogans through our politics over the last you know, 50, 60 years has also uh, had a similar effect on our language. And, and Verglin makes the very excellent point that, that most of the, the big words we use in our political debates and discussions are just unanalyzed topics, like democracy. What does that word mean? Or freedom? Or uh, socialism? I mean, what does the word socialism actually mean, right? It's kind of social... We take the word social and put an ism behind it. That is a very peculiar word, isn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, people, I've been called a socialist falsely. It means a hundred different things to a hundred different people. And now, that's a problem. The, it is. And there are a couple of other things I wanted to discuss, too, that I noticed, and I'd like you to comment on mm -hmm. it, that definitely caught my eye. Number one is Virgilin's contention, again, correct me if I'm wrong, that Marxist, Leninists, and National Socialists, many of them from his own observations, were motivated by the A word, alienation. Yes. Uh, can you comment on that? And then we're going to talk about his rejection across the board of ideology. Yes. That's a point. So let's yeah. talk about alienation. What are, what are, can you elaborate on that? Well, please? this is where the Gnostic part comes in. See, uh, an alienated person is a person who's bound to say that the world is against me that God is against me, that the game is rigged, right? Because they're not just alienated, they're demoralized as well. And so they develop this negative attitude. Oh, no. Jeff? 